Okay, so welcome to the American Library in Paris, Evenings with an Author. I'm Gabrielle McFarland. Um, tonight, we're very excited to be speaking with and hearing a bit of reading from the authors and editor of um, the newest book. I wanna get the full title here. The Anthology, The Best Women's Travel Writing, Volume 12, Stories from Around the World with editor Lavinia Spaulding and contributing writers, Christina Amon, Marcia DeSanctis, and Colette Hanahan. Moderating the conversation is Erin Byrne. Erin is an author, editor, and screenwriter who divides her time between Seattle, the Bay Area, and Paris. Most recently, her piece, Our Ravaged Lady, received the 2020 Grand Prize Solas Award for Travel Story of the Year. Currently, Erin is working on a screenplay now in pre-production in Spain, as well as a novel in occupied Paris. In addition to writing, Erin hosts the Lit Wings event series and serves as collaborating curator of travel writing and photography for the Creative Process Exhibition. So Erin, thank you for being here tonight and thank you to all of our panelists. I'm gonna go and head and hand things over to you to introduce our panelists more and speak to your newest book. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. I'm, we are so excited and honored to be here. Um, exactly one year ago, I was there in Paris and I kind of had to flee because of COVID. So in a way, I have always just kind of felt like I'm still on that trip. <laughs> so it's really great to see everybody. Uh, I have to apologize right off the bat because my, my brain really doesn't process the chat feature. So if you're, I, everybody else will, but if you're chatting and I don't pay attention to you, uh, I don't want you to get your feelings hurt. Okay, we are here to celebrate the uh, new edition of the Best Women's Travel Writing. And our publisher, Larry Habiger, is here. He publishes this series and the um, Best Travel Writing series, and he has published My Wings book and Marsha's 100 Places in France, Every Woman Should Go. So um, I just wanted to give him a shout out. So it's, it's, such, it's so exciting to be here with four phenomenal writers who are also dearest, dearest friends from all over the US. Uh, Colette, Colette, I think you're in uh, San Francisco now. Where are you? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, I wasn't quite sure. Um, Colette came uh, to Shakespeare and Company for one of my workshops there in Paris, and I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, Christina is in, I like to say, Rouge and roll the R, Oregon. And uh, Christina has, has taught a few workshops with me there in Paris. So uh, a lot of our writers there um, are here tonight. Marcia is in Connecticut. And her book, uh, 100 Places in France Every Woman Should Go, is full of new ideas and sibling stories. And I love that book. Um, I kind of think of Wings and her book as sister books, but her, she's the older, wiser sister. <laughs> and Lavinia, Lavinia's son, Ellis, goes to French school. And she also, as soon as travel resumes, probably the first thing she's gonna do is come to Paris and teach because she was supposed to be doing that last summer and it had to cancel. So um, I'll let her tell you more about that later. But as we all right now have to pretend to travel, the best women's travel writing transports. And this volume has essays that are so deep and meaningful and offer just like an array of gems. I'm so happy to introduce Lavinia Spaulding. She is our dear editor of the best women's travel writing. And she's also the author of Writing Away and the co-author of With a Measure of Grace and This Immeasurable Place two beautiful, beautiful cookbooks that I actually have up in my kitchen. 
Her work appears in such publications as Afar, Tin House, Long Reads, Yoga Journal, Sunset, Ms., the San Francisco Chronicle, and The Guardian, and, and has been widely anthologized. Her work has won Gold, Lowell, Thomas, and Solis Awards and has been recognized by the best American travel writing. She lives with her family in New Orleans and on Cape Cod, Lavinia. Thank you. Hi, Erin. Hi, everyone. It's so fun to, to be in Paris with you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and to see so many beloved faces. Um, both my mom and my mom-in-law are here. So I just wanna say hello. Um, so, so yeah, this is the best women's travel writing, volume 12. It's the sixth that I've had the honor of editing. And um, it, was a, it was a sort of a banner year for this anthology. I received 1300 submissions this year. And I chose 34 out of those 1300. And it's a, it's a very diverse collection with stories from all over the world, from places I can barely pronounce like Azerbaijan, I have pronounced it wrong sometimes, um, to Bhutan, uh, Colombia, Finland, I'm thinking alphabetically, um, Greece, all over the place, all the way to Tanzania and Yosemite. We have um, wildly diverse voices and narratives and themes and, uh, and I'm, I'm really proud of it. It was a strange year to put out a travel anthology um, because no one was traveling. But it was very comforting to me personally to be reading 1300 travel essays during lockdown. So, um, so yeah, it's travel, it's published by Traveler's Tales. And Traveler's Tales is an independent press out of California that has a reputation for putting out the kinds of books that are that really speak to the, the Traveler's Heart, the, um, the New York Times called it the, the, the sort of stories that you'd tell um, in a dimly lit cafe or something along those lines. And, um, and so I'm just really pleased to be here tonight. Um, I'm just going to read one paragraph of my introduction for you, and then um, we'll go on with our program. Oh, I do need my reading glasses for this. This book marks the 12th volume of the best women's travel writing series and the sixth I've edited. Over the years, I've occasionally been asked, what is women's travel writing and why is it different or special? I never quite nail the answer. It's complex, but I do know that in meandering through women's essays, I always seem to trip across something I'm not even aware I'm seeking, but vitally need. These some things run the gamut from escape to inspiration, to connection to catharsis, and always lodged sturdily in there among everything else is the truth. I always find truth, or more accurately, I am guided to it. The collection you hold in your hands is rife with these necessary some things ranging in locale from a ferry on the stormy Adriatic Sea to a hostel lounge in Bolivia, to the back seat of a police car in Colombia, and covering topics as motley as a train robbery in Italy, an amateur autopsy in Ireland, and a fairy tale romance in Indonesia. The 34 essays I selected led me to a secret corner of a place and an emotion and shone lights on precisely what needed to be illuminated. So I invite you all to be illuminated this evening or this morning, depending on where you are, by my wonderful, wonderful contributors, Erin, Marsha, Colette, and Christina. And Erin is going to read her story. 
Um, and I'm going to introduce her again because I have it in front of me. Erin Byrne is author of Wings, Gifts of Art, Life and Travel in France, editor of Vignettes and Postcards from Paris and Vignettes and Postcards from Morocco and writer of the Storykeeper film. She has taught writing at Shakespeare and Company Bookstore in Paris, at Book Passage and on deep travel trips. Erin is host of Lit Wings event series featuring writers, photographers, and filmmakers, and the travel writing and photography curator for the Creative Process Exhibition. This story was winner of the 2020 Grand Prize Solace Award for Travel Story of the Year and was first published in Hidden Compass. Thank you, Lavinia. Take us away, Erin. <laughs> wow, I didn't know I was getting two introductions. <laughs> More about the Solace Award later in the program. Um, we're gonna, I'm, I'm sort of aiming, since you can't hop on planes, to give you some ideas for maybe a road trip. Start, I'll start us off in Paris and then Marsha is gonna take us to Mont Saint-Michel and then Christina is gonna take us to um, the south of Spain. Well, you know, we Americans are kind of young. We're just emerging from our terrible twos with our very own L'Enfant Roy. <laughs> And you, France, are a little older and wiser. And I always learn from you. This essay was written in the fall of 2019. It's about how the long arc of the history of Notre Dame Cathedral changed me as I endured crisis after crisis. Divorce, the effects of a stroke, four concussions, the death of my father. Considering the big news in France today about the clergy. Let's view her as a spiritual, literary, and historical monument. Uh, but Notre Dame is yours. But maybe you haven't been down to see her for a while. So now that our lives have gone haywire, so I'd like to do something different with you and visit her together because she speaks to us now. I ask you to ponder your past year of political upheaval, protest and pandemic, a word uttered in this, the day after the fire that we all know now that our homes have become the places we live our greatest moments. What battles have you waged? Who have you lost? and what has endured in the center of your life. Our ravaged lady, she lived many lives and here was the burnt offering of another. Notre Dame's lace spire sizzled, crumbled and fell and the gigantic hole it created became a cauldron. Flames golden to orange to red assaulted Paris's lavender sky and smoke billowed in gray explosions. Silhouetted against glowing cinders, her bell tower stood dignified, but unprotected. My friends and I watched from the Ile Saint Louis, along with all of Paris, mouths agape, tears stinging our eyes, joining in a collective horror-filled gasp as the cathedral battled for her very existence. Firefighters wrestled with the blaze as a stone edifice trapped heat and smoke, rendering the burning forest of ceiling beams unreachable. The 850 year old wood had flared up like kindling and by the time the firefighters arrived, it was out of control. The hollow meandering roar of the conflagration was punctuated by the thunder of falling wood and stone and the screeching of twisting iron. Hugo's vast symphony of stone had Stravinsky'd. The next day, Emmanuel Macron spoke. Notre Dame is our history. It's our literature, it's our imagery. It's the place we live our greatest moments from wars to pandemics to liberation. 
Her first stone was laid in 1163 at kilometer zero with the faithful gathering to light candles. 200 years later, she received her bell towers and her best feature, rose windows, glittering eyes from which her spirit shone forth. When Notre Dame was just three centuries old, Huguenots battling Catholics attacked her facade, hacking the heads off her statue. When she was four, Louis XIV had Our Lady's eyes ripped out and replaced with white glass. When she was five, revolutionaries hacked off more statues, melted down her bells to make cannons, and renamed her the Temple of Reason. Through all of this, people lit candles under bright or colorless glass, in turmoil and in peacetime, in sorrow and in joy. After the fire was discovered, the iron scaffolding on the spire's exterior had welded together, increasing the chance of collapse. Hundreds of tons of lead were released into the night sky. Her bell towers had been 15 minutes from crumbling, but firefighters had arced water over the blaze to dampen them, which saved her towers but seeped into the mortar between her stones, moving just one even to rescue her from ruin, might have caused her to say, cave in. Nothing could be moved because all had not yet settled. You saw her waiting. In 1830, Victor Hugo created The Hunchback of Notre Dame, a character so intertwined with the cathedral that he was its soul. At the time, Notre Dame was a wreck. The city renovated, but Quasimodo had to wait 25 years for his new home. World War I's bombs, bullets, and shrapnel punctured Notre Dame. During World War II, Our Lady's eyes were removed again, and she endured four long years of blind silence, her bells mute. By the liberation of Paris in August 1944, her demise was imminent. Hitler ordered his general in Paris to detonate her, but he refused. During the celebration, Charles de Gaulle approached Notre Dame. Parisians had fought the Germans from barricades, piles of tables and chairs with any weapon they could find and chaos still reigned. German snipers remained high in the Gothic arches. De Gaulle walked straight ahead, shoulders high, his tall flame, frame never flinching as bullets zinged from all sides and people scampered for shelter into Notre Dame's interior to a blizzard of fire from the rafters. He remained for a 15 minute celebration. Our Lady of Paris had been waiting a long time for this and her bells rang out. Louis XIV considered it his divine right never to suffer a delay but you have learned through revolutions, wars, rains, and riots, in queues and metro, metro stations, in bistros and museums, that most of us have to wait a little. In the days following the fire, access to the incinerated cathedral was blocked, but crowds stood nearby pondering her cinders and ash, the gaping hole in the center of her flying buttresses, her singed but intact rose windows like eyes with smudged mascara. You quietly contemplated Notre Dame, dreaming of her next life and protesting it on the weekend. Atandra, your word for wait, also means to expect, not so in English. Perhaps you take the long view, the past is prologue, to honor the old and envision the new are one and the same, to wait is to anticipate. That summer, the cathedral sanctuary was open to the elements. Her interior remained a jumble of accumulated debris. Charred wood like pickup sticks and ch stone chunks lay on the floor in pinpoint rays of sunlight on shredded cane chairs among piles of ashes. Everything could have caved in at any moment. Months after the fire, Notre Dame was still a triage site. 
Our Lady persisted on pause. Her roof was covered that fall, but she stayed bound within her iron cage. That first Christmas came and went with no mass, no real movement, no restoration of her sanctuary. But inside the cathedral, among the detritus and dust, stood the altar with its gold cross. And next to that, the marble pieta, where Notre Dame's namesake holds her departed with love. The center of the center remained and the rest was reimagined. Parisian Magazine wrote, the catastrophe refers to our humility and our helplessness. It is during those times when I'm aware of both that what endures becomes clear. Each night I light three candles in a row and contemplate layers of meaning in the combination of past, present, and future. I remember that cauldron of violent flames licking the sky, and I try to emulate Hugo's belief in Quasimodo swinging from the rafters, Charles de Gaulle's heroic heart, and the resilience that this cathedral herself displayed in all her brokenness. Until our ravaged lady rises from the ashes, we will have to do as she does to stand with dignity in our humility and helplessness, light a few candles and wait a little longer. Okay, I'm so excited to introduce Marcia De Sanctus. Marcia writes for Vogue and Travel and Leisure magazines and about a zillion other magazines that she doesn't even mention here in her bio. She is the author of the New York Times bestseller, 100 Places in France Every Woman Should Go. Her collection of essays, A Hard Place to Leave, comes out in April of 2022. And the story that she is just about to read just won the 2021 Grand Prize Solos Award for Travel Story of the Year. And it is a well deserved, and I'm so excited to introduce Marcia to thank us. Thank you so much. Just making sure my mic is on here. Um, yes. Thank you. And it it is a little. I was thinking and maybe talking to Erin about it that it's interesting that two stories about magnificent magnificent French churches um, have been honored like this and and that we're both reading stories, my stories about my Saint Michel. Um, and I, I wonder if it's because whatever your faith or lack of it, we tend to be vulnerable inside churches. They are places that are permeated with mystery. And it is what kind of when we confront the truly unknown aspect of spirituality, um, I think we, we, that's when we find ourselves very open to to um, self-discovery. So that's a little bit what happened during a uh, fateful morning and night um, on Mont Saint-Michel. And I'm just gonna, the story's called Headlights. Um, and I'm just gonna read the first couple of pages. It's not really when the action starts, but it will set you up um, because it sets up what I was looking for when I went there. Uh, so the story is Headlights. February is not the ideal time for a road trip to Northern France, but the moodiness of the sea, wind and sky appeals to a certain breed of loner like me, drawn to the echoing voids of the off season. Coastal Normandy is famous for its dramatic weather and in winter it grows wilder still with thrashing winds and squalls of frozen sleet that churn up from the English Channel. The region is a sweep of battlegrounds and fortified castles, stone cold Norman abbeys and craggy ports that have hosted centuries of departing and returning soldiers. Here, God and war forge their strange alliance as they often do. And the backdrop of tempests, tides and occasional shards of sunlight render it fertile ground for ghosts and their keepers. I had endeavored to Mont Saint-Michel to seek some perfect solitude 
one night was all I could spare for a brief reconciliation between me and my universe, an instant quelling of the racing brain. I had always wanted to spend a night in the village beneath the monastery, and the dead of winter seemed an ideal time to do it, with theatrical weather, but without swarms of visitors filing into the one narrow street. I hoped just for a spell to experience the Abbey as the pilgrims had in this place that brings such wonder to the eye that only heavenly devotion and fear of hell could have conceived it. More than a thousand years ago, men had achieved the near impossible and built a church atop a granite rock in the middle of a bay slashed by monster tides and some of the fiercest currents on earth. To get there, let alone to ferry construction materials on their backs meant to brave a rushing sea, quicksand, wind, and fog. Later, pilgrims were obliged to wait for low tide to cross over to Mont Saint-Michel, but there was always risk one the faithful were willing to take. By the time they arrived to commune in silence with the resident monks, they had already weeded themselves out and proven their piety along with their mettle. I suppose I sought some clue of the divine here as well. In France, I often venture into the dusky wombs of cathedrals, basilicas, and rural parishes. While inside these limestone temples, I look for proof of the Almighty, signs anyway, and the, wisdoms of saint, the wisdom of saints. In Europe, crosses loom over every village, admonishing me with very little subtlety of what I can never really abandon. I am a committed former Catholic, but the church I was born into and raised in still, still whispers to me daily. It is a firm, plaintive voice that offers one truth. This is who you are. I'm not brave enough to have renounced my religion outright. Instead, I chucked it aside. Sunday school did an excellent job of teaching me everything and everyone I was meant to fear. But not long after my confirmation, I began to crave adventure with boys, a definite no-no with the nuns. Soon word sunk in that women were outcasts in the church and the Pope was okay with that. Eventually, I learned that some of the priests in my native Boston might be criminals. I slipped away, stopped going to mass. All that I absorbed from catechism, guilt, sin, purgatory, mercy, the promise of heaven and intense dread of the alternative still unwittingly shapes my life. Most of the time when I enter a church, once I cross myself at the holy water font, the outline of faith emerges as if this ancient gesture tracing out a crucifix on my head and chest offers not just a place of worship, but also to comfort and certainty. When I'm in a pew, the sacred space above me intuits my secrets, listens to and forgives them all. For what, if not salvation, would the ancients construct these elaborate structures, embellish them with statuary and stories told in colored glass? It is safer to believe, and in a church, I do. And then it dissipates as soon as I exit from sanctuary to sunlight. These bursts of affinity with something ancient and vast bring not exactly euphoria, but calm. We mortals are not the most important force on earth, so I can get over myself already. Maybe at Mont Saint-Michel with its near miraculous backstory, I'd again find that holy ethereal sunbeam I never stopped chasing. All I needed was a few minutes. I parked my car and took the bus along the causeway. The last time I had visited, it was July, two decades ago. Then I wore a tank top and a water bottle sloshed around my purse. The heat had been severe and I trekked barefoot across the tidal flats, sun baking my back, flip flops in hand. It was suffocatingly, grotesquely crowded and all of us tourists gazed up hopefully at the monastery as if vying for a gulp of oxygen. And there he was, Archangel Michael, the prince of them all, commander of God's army and Catholicism, literal angel of death. He descends in our final hour to assist the dying and escort us to heaven as long as we proclaim our faith. It was he during a visitation in the year 706 who told the local bishop to build here and build high. His gold figure crowns the spire of Mont Saint-Michel and on that sunny day, his wings and raised swords seemed to throw sparks into the sky. This time, I was surprised when the bus left me a fair distance from the bottom of the hill in the village. 
It was supposed to stop right at the foot of town. But the stormy February weather had made a mess of things and the approach was a massive construction zone. Bulldozers and bobcats were scattered beside the path as were orange plastic ribbons that formed makeshift do not cross fences. It was, I learned, the home stretch for the colossal reclamation project that re would return the sea to the Bay of Mont Saint-Michel, which had been silted over by centuries of agricultural development. The currents though were unchanged, still erratic and still deadly. High tide can rise up to 45 feet and water sweeps in at an astonishing 200 feet per minute. Occasionally a video pops up on YouTube of fools who try to beat the sea, fail and get rescued by helicopter. Also periodically some Deluded danger junkie wanders into the quicksand. There is still quicksand and must be pulled to safety. The street that strained to accommodate a half a million tourists a year was hushed with the absence of people. I climbed to the abbey and walked around the monastery and the merveille, the church, stopping at the cloister lined with box, boxwoods and tiny, tidy, colonnaded allee, a green respite on this grim day. From here was a view up the Norman and down the Breton coast and surrounding it all the sea. It was gray and thick as wet cement while the sky bore the whites of drifting snow. I wandered through the chambers and chapels, the vacant assembly rooms and grand halls that bore no reminders of their bustling past. I stood at altars and under crosses, friezes and seawater green stained glass windows I gazed up at Gothic choirs, vaults, and across to fireplaces, crucifixes, and the gold cloaked figure of Notre Dame du Mont d'Ambre. But I struggled, I struggled to feel the presence of a deity in these rooms. The best I could do was reflect on the ingenuity of the men who believed in one so strongly. They carried boulders across this godforsaken landscape, hoisted them up, and erected a monument in tribute. I learned to experience the strength of, con the strength of conviction but all I could do was admire theirs. Here in the emptiness of this medieval abbey, abbey, I felt strangely empty too. I couldn't even summon a prayer to murmur. Okay, so that's all I'll read. Um, and uh, wow, thank you again for having us. I feel like, um, I feel like I'm in Paris for a minute. My great pleasure to introduce Christina Amon. Is it Ammon or Ammon? Ammon. Ammon. Yeah. Sorry about that. I know her just as Christina and I know her quite well. <laughs> Christina Ammon is proud to have published several, sorry, is proud to have published travel stories with BBC, Orion Magazine, Hemispheres, the San Francisco, San Francisco Chronicle, Condé Nast and numerous anthologies. Since the pandemic, however, she has fallen in love with writing essays about country life for her tiny local newspaper, The Apple Gator. Eventually, she plans to resume her rambling ways and continue hosting writing adventures abroad through her company, Deep Travel Workshops. But for now, Christina enjoys watching hummingbirds from her porch in rural <laughs> Oregon. <laughs> Take it away. All right, thank you, Marcia. And yeah, thank you, Lavinia, for all your good editing on these stories. And it's so great to be included um, always. So the story I wrote for the anthology is called uh, Convivencia, referring to a period in Southern Spain's history um, where people with religious differences lived in harmony together. And um, I'm, I'm following a friend on her pilgrimage to Avila, Spain, where she went to research St. Teresa. And I end up having my own revelation um, on the trip unexpectedly. So that's what it's about. Here's an excerpt. Last spring, I followed my friend Anna to the town of Avila, Spain, where she'd felt called to research the 15th century mystic St. Teresa. Anna had read St. Teresa's seminal work, The Interior Castle, in her 20s and was captured by the nun's blueprint of the soul as a many-roomed castle, the center of which could be entered through the gateways of prayer and meditation. By going straight to the source, to the very convent where the Carmelite nun lived, to the cobbled lanes where she'd walked, and to the cathedrals where she'd prayed, Anna hoped to find inspiration for a collection of poetry she aimed to write. I also hoped to get an epiphany myself, she admitted. 
I held no personal ambitions for the trip, but loved the concept of traveling to a place for artistic inspiration, even as a tag along. So although this town of stones and saints wasn't my personal pilgrimage, when we arrived to the picturesque city on a sunny afternoon, I was happy to be there. Tapas bar lined the old streets, wide squares were clustered with silver chairs and conversation, and there was that warm honey light that felt so quintessentially Spain. We trundled our suitcases from the train station until the pavement of the new city yielded to cobblestone inside the old walled part of town. Our apartment was in St. Teresa Square and we were relieved on arrival to find a spacious living room and a wide window. Best of all, there were two separate bedrooms. To cut costs, Anna and I mostly share rooms when we travel, an arrangement that works surprisingly well given that we are opposites in many, if not most ways. For example, Anna cleans while she cooks, while I prefer to do the dishes straight after. She hangs her clothes in the closet right away while I work straight from my suitcase. In sum, I'm messy and Anna is neat, but these surface differences are easily resolved and I rein in my mess the best I can. The real secret to our harmony is in our quiet style of traveling. We spend whole days apart, solitary flaneurs who keep good company with journals until dinner time. Then, over glasses of Rioja and wedges of Manchego, we unpack the day's ideas and adventures. Perhaps more important, though, is that we share the same killjoy early to bed, early to rise circadian rhythm. Our idea of a great night is to nest in with a book. Still, four weeks traveling together is a very long time, and since every traveler must pin her drifting existential discontent on something, a travel companion, even the perfect one, is an easy target. In fact, it was Anna's very perfection that I began to hone in on, imagining it was being imposed on me in the form of seemingly innocuous statements, which I took as cloaked suggestions. I'm gonna to go to the bathroom now. You never know, there might not be one on the bus, she'd declare. Or she'd pour a can of nuts into a Ziploc saying, it's always good to bring a snack on the train. I even found myself sighing at her perfect eating habits, the whole kernel oatmeal she'd soak each night before going to bed. Why not a carefree cinnamon bun or a naughty sugar laced churro, I wondered. After taking stock of the apartment and enjoying the bright view of the square, we picked rooms and began to freshen up. In my own space now and free to be me, I stationed my overstuffed suitcase on the floor and let its contents eviscerate across the tiles. Rumpled t-shirts, ticket stubs, uncoupled socks. After my shower, I tossed a wet towel across my bed in gleeful rebellion. Come afternoon, we wandered out into the square, each with our respective books. Anna had Teresa's interior castle, of course, and I carried The Dream at the End of the World, a book by Michelle Green about Paul Bowles and the lost generation in Tangier, Morocco. Since college, I'd been captured with Bowles and his rowdy and defiant literary comrades, Kerouac and Burroughs. Their rebellion echoed my own discontent with society and the lawless zone that was Tangier in the 50s. And the Lala zone that was Tangier in the 50s seemed an enchanting place to question mainstream norms. Now, nearing the end of the book, I was eager to finish it. We found a table in the square and ordered. Anna opened her heavily marked copy of the interior castle and I resumed the section describing Woolworth heiress Barbara Hutton's elaborate fits. At her mansion above Tangier, Hutton dazzled guests like Truman Capote with belly dancers, camel drivers, nomadic tribesmen, monkeys, and snake charmers. As usual, drugs, sex, and guns were an ample supply. I looked up from my pages and chuckled at the opposite nature of our books. While in Anna's book, the 15th century St. Teresa furnished her metaphoric interior castle with virtue and penance, the character in my pages cavorted and indulged in actual brick and mortar castles. While St. Teresa sought to make the monastery stricter and more austere, in the city of vice, nothing was forbidden except murder and rape. After completing a chapter, I stirred my hot chocolate and wondered when I had last eaten fruit. I think the last piece of fruit I had was in that dessert back in Tangier, I confessed, admiring Anna's porcelain complexion. The next day we split. I carried the dream at the end of the world to a sidewalk cafe and Anna set off to research St. Teresa. I ordered an espresso and opened my book. Now Phyllis de Faye, a Tangier socialite, was chartering a cargo ship to ferry her menagerie of cats, rodents, horses, and other pets to Portugal, where she had just purchased an old castle. Like many of the Tangier expats living there in the 50s, Phyllis's life seemed to be so easy as to be borderline boring, and so she had to manufacture her own predicaments. After a couple of chowers, uh, chapters, I paid my bill and decided to take the audio tour of the impressive walls that earned Avila UNESCO World Heritage status. 
I rented my headset at the tourist stand and ascended the stairs to begin my procession along the long fortification. Along the way, I pushed numbered buttons and listened to historical commentaries through the earpiece. Constructed between the, 5th, the 11th and 15th centuries to ward off Moorish invasions, the walls were a scenic remnant of the religious conflicts between Morocco and Spain. The Moors took over the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula in 711, and then the Christians took it back in their Reconquista. But in the 8th century, a new era took hold, La Convivencia. During this time, Muslims, Jews, and Christians purportedly shared Al-Andalus in peace. This convivencia broke down with the Inquisition, however, when even St. Teresa herself was subject to interrogation. Her Jewish merchant grandfather made her suspect, as did her visions and spiritual ecstasies, which were seen as potentially false. Church bells chimed and I paused for a rest. I stared out at the Castilian Plateau through the walls crenulations, seeing vineyards, stone habitations, and the Sierra Gredos Mountains in the distance. My thoughts returned to Paul Bowles and how much in my 20s I had admired his atheistic worldview. In his novel, The Sheltering Sky, the characters Kit and Port ventured into the vast Sahara to shed the fortifications of mainstream religion and ideologies and face down the infinite straight on. Bowles and his wife Jane did the very same thing in real life, smoking keef, taking my dune, and courting the void among the dunes. It seemed so cool to me at the time, so honest and brave, and echoed my own youthful desire to shed my conservative, religious, Midwestern upbringing. Stepping outside the norms like marrying early and having a conventional job felt like a way to live more vividly and fully. Now in my 40s, I question that theory. So then I just go on to, to reevaluate my relationship with Paul Bowles and my feelings about spirituality. So thank you. And now I will introduce Colette, who did the beautiful paintings for the book. Um, just write what you know. These were Colette's creative writing professor's parting word when she graduated. Realizing she didn't really know anything, she moved around the country for 12 years, taking 19 jobs that seemed interesting and traveling abroad in between. Eight years ago, after moving to San Francisco for the fourth time, she took a travel writing class at City College. Through this class, she was introduced to Weekday Wanderlust and a group of writers who absolutely changed her life and exploded her heart. Colette is mainly a painter, but writing is still a true love. And as you know, she illustrated the book and has an essay in it as well. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. This is so fun to be here and listen to these stories that I've read many times through um, the words of the, the beautiful authors. And to be here with Lavinia and um, thank you to the library. This is really fun. Um, Yay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to interview you. Uh, but I wanted to say first that, uh, Christina, thank you for your story. I have traveled actually with Anna and Christina and it just makes me miss traveling with you. And I wanted to also say that Anna's book uh, about St. Teresa has been published by Press 53 and it's called Hope of Stones. Mm. And it's out, yes. And Anna is also a poetess, and she illustrated uh, my Wings book and my Morocco book. So I wanted to mention that before I move to Colette. So Colette at Weekday Wanderlust <laughs> a few years ago in San Francisco, you just said something like, oh, I kind of feel like traveling to Europe. And I was like, well, you know, I'm teaching this, this writing workshop in Paris, why don't you come? And I got to Paris and there she was sitting there. I mean, she, she came and so there she was upstairs at Shakespeare and Company with everybody. And uh, it was such a pleasure. And I think that maybe the, the story that you have in the book, The Call of Sirens, which is just a gorgeous story I wish that you would have had time to read it, but I think that we were kind of working on it. I think you started working on it. I in started that. it, I started it <clears throat> in Shakespeare and Company, and it's about, it's a coming of age story about France, actually, yeah. about um, uh, the south of France. Yeah. yeah, it's lovely. So if you get a chance to read Colette's uh, story in the book, please do. Um, but I, I am really interested in the way that you did these unbelievably gorgeous and uh, more than that, just um, hmm. 
insightful paintings for this book. I have been at your house before a show and you also <laughs> illustrated uh, my vignettes of both yes. cards and you did it like in a flash. I think you may have done like, I don't know, how many sketches? It's like did almost you? 50. I think for your yeah. book, there's almost 50. Yeah, and, and then I think you did it like two weeks or something. Right? It, was a, it was a very, very tight turnaround. <laughs> yeah. So the yeah. videos that Lavinia put out a bunch of videos um, and they're just beautiful of you and they're sort of sped up of you sketch doing these sketches and paintings. And that is kind of how I imagine you working in that kind of a sped up way. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, um, but also this, the, the images that you chose, like the one for mine is just these three candles in a row and they are, they are actually Notre Dame. And it just, when you sent me, I think the video of you sketching them. And when I saw it, I, I, I cried because it showed such a deep insight and understanding of my story. And I know from all of the paintings that you have done um, for stories that you do that, like you read the stories so carefully and your art reflects the writing in such a beautiful way. I, I'm just so in awe of you. And so I wonder if you can uh, talk a little bit about your process. Sure, yeah, well, thank you, Erin, that's so nice. Um, Cause usually, you know, for my paintings, it's just me alone. So this is just, such a fun dream project to be working with Lavinia and Larry and James. And really the process was Lavinia would send me stories when she was either done editing or pretty close. And, um, I, and I was in quarantine, I was in three different quarantines and two solo. So I would just get these sort of like friends sent to me and I would just like be able to spend the day reading these stories that are so, so beautiful and inspiring as everyone's been saying. <clears throat> so that was just like another side silver lining. And then I got to read them and Lavinia and Larry and James sort of let me pretty much go with it. It was really um, an autonomous decision for me to find something that really stuck out for me. And sometimes I would run it by Lavinia, but usually she would just say, go for it. I trust you. I love your work. She was so supportive. <clears throat> um, and I would get stuck sometimes when a story was maybe a little complicated and then I would run it by Lavinia and she would help me work through some ideas. But basically, um, I would just read one at a time and then go for it and experimenting with the time-lapse film. Um, Candace, uh, one of our other friends, had told me that maybe it would be fun to try out. So, and Lavinia was on board and so we, uh, yeah, we tried it out and it was really fun to see them go that fast. And um, and just to sort of, they were fun because the turn, turnaround was also pretty tight. So it was just sort of going with it, experimenting, no perfectionism, you know. It, um, and um, so that was really good for me too. So where can we find these? Uh, do you have them? I know they're on Facebook, but like how can we find this? Yeah, I think they're on my website. So there's, is, um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's 35 of them, I think, 35. And most of them are on my website. So it's just my name, ColetteHannahan.com. Okay. And, and also uh, your work, like your paintings, your work outside of illustrating all these books are just incredible. And I know that you have done many, many open studios and you've been shown all over the world. And I remember that I was so excited when I saw some of your paintings in the Ferry Building. So uh, yeah. um, we can find all of your work on your website. Is that right? Yeah. All of it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right now I don't have too much work. I'm, I'm working on building it back up, but um, it, it will go on there when I'm when it's when it's ready <laughs> then i also have a mail list so i'll, I'll uh, email people when things are ready to roll and shows start coming back on the calendar after the okay. pandemic hopefully yeah really you must have really missed that 
Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think Marsha, Marsha has her, I don't have my, you. I just want to pull up an example. Oh, I yeah. owner of, so this is the spire of Mont Saint Michel and there is the archangel up there. And I yeah. love how you chose this palette of watery blues um, to do Mont Saint Michel. So I'm, I haven't actually had it framed yet because I, I I got it as a gift for Christmas and um, I just put it somewhere and I love where it is, but isn't it just beautiful? Yeah, um, it really is. Colette has a, she so, does. Rendered so beautifully. She does Thank a lot you. of work with skies, like skies are kind of oh. your, I have, I have painting, I have one oh, there's <laughs> up there um, of the Sahara sky. Oh, and there's Lavinia has that one. Yeah, and I have the San Francisco sky in my bedroom, yeah. Lots of Colette. I actually have a gorgeous, gorgeous um, sketch of the interior of Notre Dame that you did yeah. for, I think it was for Christina's story in uh, yeah. Vignettes and Blackbirds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Just, Thank, you so Thank you so Thank you. Thank you, Colette. Oh, Thank you, everybody. So, Lavinia, um, what an honor to be able to interview you. It's so fun. <laughs> Um, I recently moved, as you know, I think you did too. And, um, I just, this morning, I have to reach over here and get this. I just unearthed my collection of the best women's travel writing <laughs> and it goes way back. And it was really fun to kind of, uh, kind of remember how I acquired these books because, I have stories in the last in the last three, but I also have the three previous versions that you edited. You edited uh, six volumes, and those three are are uh, volumes that I submitted stories to that didn't get in the book. Sorry. And I I always I always always encourage my writers that I work with to submit and just to keep submitting. So, you know, it was, it was this thing of like, of, of just writers, don't give up, keep submitting, right? And I know that you have edited these for uh, 10 years. It's such a highly regarded collection. It's always different. It's always fabulous and trans transportative. And I always encourage, encourage um, I encourage everybody to read it. It's not, it, it's a book about women, you know, stories by women travelers. And you can talk about this if you want. I know you get this a lot, but um, it's not just for women to read for sure. Um, and this particular, this particular volume, this new one, it's really prescient and it has such depth and it addresses so many current issues and offers some really profound insights into the world. Um, so I wonder if you can talk about, about this volume and your introduction, which is just uh, so fantastic, is, is mentions getting lost in Fez, which is a place that we all are perpetually lost in for sure but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about this volume and about getting lost and sure sure well um so I first of all thank you for saying that about um persevering when in in terms of submitting to this because I have noticed sometimes that times uh, times do I have some back? Sorry. It's okay. Um, so I've noticed um, so I've that I have like a-, Colette, a sorry. Writer. Sorry to interrupt you, Lavinia. Could Colette, could you mute your mic and Marsha as well? I think maybe that's, that's causing nice. some sort of echo. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. No, that was, I was like, wait, that hasn't happened before. <laughs> um, there's three of me in the room. That's too many. <laughs> um, so I've noticed that a writer will, will submit um 
and submit and submit. And then I will accept a story and they'll submit and I'll accept another story. And maybe the next one doesn't fit. And so I don't accept it. And that's the, the, the last that I'll ever hear from that writer. And it's, it's too mm. bad because often a story won't make it in, not because it isn't a completely wonderful, brilliant story, but because I have another story of that subject or that destination um, and I and I don't want to repeat it. So so I appreciate that um, that advice. And um, so in terms of this of this book, I wrote about being lost because I felt really lost when I was writing my introduction. Um, <clears throat> it was I just didn't know what to write about. It was a, a very strange and intense time in our country with the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement. And so much was really uh, just felt really distilled. And I didn't know where to start writing. And I had planned to write about Colombia. I had a trip, um, an upcoming trip to Colombia with my best friend to celebrate my 50th birthday. And I thought, well, there'll be plenty of material in Colombia, I will write my introduction about that. And then of course, five days before my uh, trip, I had to cancel it because COVID had gotten really bad. And um, so I, I spent my 50th birthday in my backyard having a lovely dinner with my family, but I couldn't really write about that for my introduction. So. I was feeling more and more lost. And finally, I just sort of decided to write into that lostness. And, um, and the last time I had felt really, really lost was in the Fez Medina. When I traveled there with Christina on one of her uh, deep travel workshops, I was teaching. Um, and I just, I am, I am always lost. I am someone who gets lost everywhere I go, it, um, it's kind of my superpower. Um, I, I'm really good at it. I can get lost anywhere. I, I get lost in Korea and this, you know, the last few places I'm thinking of, I got lost in Korea, I got lost in Morocco, I got lost in my neighborhood. Um, I have gotten lost in people's homes, like really helplessly lost. And uh, so, so I was, it was, a, it was an easy, you know, write what you know. It was a very easy subject for me to write about being lost. But also, but I tied it into feeling lost in this time and how um, I got some advice in Morocco to, um, to let myself get lost. And when I said, but what about when I don't want to be lost anymore, um, the person said, well, ask a woman for, you know, for directions, women won't steer you wrong. And I thought about that a lot as I was uh, writing this introduction. But I also, you know, I, I have settled into a real love affair with being lost in my old age. I find it a very rich experience. If I'm not, you know, in danger, it is something that I actually really embrace. And I think it's a, the reason why I've settled into it is a combination of um, that advice in, in Morocco and being a Buddhist, I've been a, a practicing Buddhist for 17 years. And there's just a, you know, when I get into a, a situation where I feel tense, I have tools that I can use to, to calm my mind and to sort of detach from it. But also I read uh, Rebecca Solnit's A Field Guide to Getting Lost. And that book had a, a profound influence on me. And in, in just, it's sort of a, a guide to getting lost and not just getting lost, but sort of reframing it as um, losing yourself. And it, it's, it really helped me to 
I guess have a love affair with being lost and to and to realize that when I do get lost, it can be a, a very enriching, enlivening, illuminating time for me as I sort of just relax into a, a, a place and um, and let it teach me what it wants to teach me, I guess. It's kind of an acquired taste, isn't it? Getting lost. Right, because we have to give up our control and our plans and our time and, but it gets kind of addictive, I think. Yeah, it's, you know, I've likened it to, to having a conversation where you're not, you stop talking and you start listening. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then good. you can learn from it. I, and even, I get lost even with GPS. You know, like it, it doesn't really help me. I lived in Korea for six years and I visited again uh, in 2018 or 19, I can't remember. And there just aren't any street signs um, in much of the city where I lived. And so GPS didn't really help me. And I, I would just have this sort of meandering surrender and there's something kind of exquisite about it when you can really surrender to it i think i, I really urge everyone to read you know you'll really enjoy lavinia's introduction in this book because she really gets into this a little bit more you know i just i i feel like the way that you edit is this kind of really unique collaborative dance and Marsha wanted to say something about uh, your editing and then I think we'll talk about it a little more okay not, oh, yeah. not everyone loves my editing <laughs> yeah no it's I, I mean it was it's almost less about your editing process you actually helped me edit this story very early when I was writing it you know a couple of years ago and I submitted it all over the place and um, and of course it's very smart and she has a very, um, a really strong sense of storytelling, of where to turn your corner, of where to make you reveal. But I, but even in, even more so, I just think that this, that the, um, that you, that it, the book kind of writ large, that you know that she edits this book, that every, where you open, you are going to immerse yourself in a different aspect of the human experience. Uh, and that is from all kinds of different voices and all kinds of different experience. So, so there's the, you know, there's the editing of the story and then there's the sort of her gifts as an editor. Um, so we're really lucky to have this, yeah. you know, collaboration um, with you. We really are, you know, I feel like you, um, you share my belief as an editor too of this idea that the writer's story is sacred and the way that you, you know, it was interesting for me because my other two stories really didn't require much editing, but this one did quite a lot because the original version was so long and I felt like you approached it in such a respectful way and that you pulled out the very best to shape the story as Marsha said. But <clears throat> I just felt like you brought such insight and um, emotional clarity to your editing. And I felt like it really elevated my prose and my story. Um, so, you, so you've edited this series for you know a decade six volumes. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your editing process. I mean, um, I, I would not say that you were easy, but that, but I mean like easy, I mean easy as far as demanding, but the way you approached, I mean, it, you have to be like that. Right, so I wonder if you can talk about your process and then maybe the character of a few of these volumes because they're all different. I would, I would love to. I first have to plug in my computer because I just got a, your computer's about to die message. 
Um, I'm not the most organized person you all know. Um, however, there we go. I, um, I really, really appreciate what both of you said because I, I'm not sure everyone appreciates my editing style. Um, I can be a bit heavy handed and in the previous volume, I, one of my, one of my uh, contributors called me a, oh, sorry. I just lost my video. That's right, um, you're here. In the, in the previous, yeah, one of my contributors for volume 11 um, called me a dominatrix editor, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, I actually appreciated it. Uh, I will line edit pretty, um, pretty intensely. And I have an intense aversion to repeated words. Even words like that or um, is, you know, so, uh, so I, I do, um, I do, uh, a lot of editing and I do definitely some structural editing and some, you know, moving around. I tend to, uh, I tend to gravitate towards stories with a lot of heart. And so it is the case that if I, for example, received two submissions, um, one from, you know, two submissions that were very, that are very similar, and one might be a bit more rough, uh, but it has more heart, I might be more willing to go with that one and just do more editing than one that is very polished, but isn't quite as, um, isn't quite as, I don't know, as passionate or, or as intimate or as uh, personal. So I, I do love a polished essay, but I, um, yeah, I try to be respectful. I hope I'm respectful in my I think editing. you are. And I, I also think to break in here that one of your great gifts is this emotional clarity. And so I love that, that you're looking for the stories with heart. And then what you do is sort of this tango of working with the writer to make the emotions more clear, more clear, more clear, more clear. So I think that's a huge gift. And, and it's reflected in every single of these six volumes, I think, you know. Thank you. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, these so what about been... these volumes? Like, like the volumes, like they all have different feels. This one I think feels dense and kind of heavy. Um, can you talk, Gabriel? Were you are you giving us the? Yeah, I was gonna go ahead and let you know that we're nearing time, but I, I want to hear the okay. answer to this question too. Okay. So go ahead. Okay, okay. Like this one, as we talked about, has more of a more of a maybe a profound feel. But what about some of the other ones? And I can hold them up when you're talking about them. So. Well, yeah, they. Are, I'm not totally sure that I can specifically address each volume, but I will say that they they definitely have different character about them. I remember, I think it was the last volume had a, was that the one I wrote about family? No, I Is think it was the one. This one or this one's the family, I think. Okay, so the one before is the one in which I wrote about water. And, uh, and that one was about family. I, you know, I, I had noticed as I was, um, not while I was compiling the stories, but when I was editing them toward the end, that for example, last time, there were a lot of stories that had water in them in, in different ways. Um, there was a story about uh, swimming, uh, in, you know, in a pool in Berkeley and another story about um, migration, about, about um, migration in Greece and and 
crossing over water. And, and so I sort of, um, I think maybe that one has sort of a more, I don't know, Piscean feel to it, <laughs> a more watery fluid feel. And the one about family, I noticed, gosh, there, at the end, there are so many stories about moms and dads and siblings. And so that always informs my introduction. And I think when I write an introduction, then it informs probably the way the reader experiences it. So it goes hand in hand, if that answers your question. Yeah, it's interesting when you said that, because when you were talking about it, like I was thinking about um, water was definitely in my story in that one. And the other one is a story about my boys, you know, <laughs> looking at art and it was like, it's uh, having done a couple anthologies, it's so interesting how you kind of choose these things and then the similarities kind of rise up off the page and it's almost like magic the way that happens. But mm -hmm. it's, re it's really reflected in these volumes. So, you know, I urge everybody to, to get the new one, but to also like you can order the backlog um, I, they have, they have several, I know they have, um, they should still have this one at Shakespeare and Company. Um, did you check Gabri Gabrielle? Did, I believe they still have that one, yes. Okay, good, yeah. And um, you know, you can order through um, Traveler's Tales directly and you know, your local independent bookstore is what we, we get excited about so and the library and libraries <laughs> of course yeah yeah so i thank you so much i feel like i'm i will i'm still kind of coming out of a trance from your readings um honestly um your writings have made me wonder if i'm not very present when i'm traveling because you're all so absorbent observant and just you're absorbing your surroundings and it's been really inspiring um, and I hope to, you know, take my notes from tonight and apply them when we can all travel again. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open the floor to Q&A. Um, we had a fun question come in, but I just wanted to start with more of a philosophical one. Um, Lavinia, you spoke about being able to get lost anywhere, even in a friend's home. Um, that being said, I have a question for all of you. I mean, when, when are you traveling? When are you traveling versus when, you know, when do you make that distinction? What is travel for you versus, you know, just leisure? When are you putting yourself um, in that headspace? Well, I'll answer that one quickly for me is that it is the headspace that makes it travel. So we always say, you know, like you can travel by going to the next block. You can travel, I mean, and we, we sort of know that now that we're in lockdown, you know, you in Paris can travel by walking down to Notre Dame, right? Like, so it's a mindset, I think. I don't know, the rest of you guys, like. I would say that I haven't traveled for pleasure in as long as I can remember, it, which isn't to say that I haven't gotten a lot of pleasure from traveling. But I'm always, I'm on such, like my senses and my powers of observation ever since I kind of started doing this or taking this direction in my writing. I'm just always just hyper aware of a story that is going to reveal itself. So yeah, it's kind of, I mean, I, I, I kind of can't imagine just <laughs> not having a notebook with me when I'm on the road. I literally can't imagine it. I, uh, I, th I, I'm not like that. I, because I, I, as you have seen, I'm not the most organized person and I get lost. I feel like I am sort of always traveling unless I'm on assignment, in which case, I am traveling and working and there's a very big distinction, but I often come, you know, a lot of travelers or travel writers, I should say, tell me that same thing that Marcia just said, like I'm, I'm never 
just on vacation anymore. Or I'm never just traveling. I'm always looking for a story. And I will say I'm always looking for a story, but I always forget. I, I very easily forget to find one <laughs> a lot of the time. I'm like, oh, wow, I really, I, I went to, um, you know, wherever. I went to Nepal and I never published a story about it. I was there for, you know, two weeks because I was just way too enjoying traveling. So I, it it's takes a, it's work though. So, sorry. It's a balance. Like I know that uh, <clears throat> Christina might be able to speak to this, but like when we would be on a deep travel trip, it would be like, okay, we're working with these people on their writing, but they're, you know, like, and I think we had a couple of trips where I was like, no, they need to concentrate on their writing. And you, you were like, well, they're in Morocco or they're in Spain, you know, and they need to travel. So it's definitely a balance, Christina, what do you think? I almost feel like my trip isn't finished until I've gone home and written the story about it. And like, while I'm in the place, I won't know that I'm in a story or oh, it'll yeah. just be like, even that trip to Avila, I have to say I enjoyed it, but it felt in the moment, just sort of day to day or, or some kind of even mundane at times of putting the headset on and being a tourist and walking around the wall. It's just like, not like this grand external adventure that I had. We, I just did tourist things, but sometimes that coming home and then like the deeper layers, um, so it's kind of like, I don't feel like I'm particularly observant, but later I go back and digest it through the writing and realize like, wow, more happened than I even realized in the moment sometimes. And it just takes that digestion later emotionally to like bring it out, I think. Yeah, I think so. Cause you're not really looking for a story. It's just a story appears. And that's why, that's what I love about journaling. And I always journal, but, um, because then if, if you if you do think of a story later, you can go back for the details. Yeah. But yeah. it's like that great Anais Nin quote, we write to taste life twice, mm -hmm. um, right? And it's in the retrospect that we really understand it and in the writing. Well, it's these things that move us on our travels and we don't know why. And then we go on this kind of treasure hunt. And I, and when I worked with writers all the time, I'm like, you know what? And you could, we could do this now. Like everyone who's here, if you just think of maybe, maybe one of your, it's not a recent travel, right? But a, a trip that you went on and think about a image or scene from that trip that really affected you, touched you, made you joyous, made you cry, made you depressed, made you angry. And then you start probing that and you find these connections that are just really exciting. Um, and, you know, even if you're not going to write about it, to, to think about your travels that way is very illuminating. I'm definitely taking notes here. Um, I think I'm what you might call a phone keys wallet traveler. I cannot, I spend all the phone keys wallet, phone keys wallet, if I'm out of my comfort zone, you know, but bullet journal, um, a lot of people have been suggesting that. So definitely noted. Um, we have a fun question here. Have any of you ever unexpectedly run into someone you knew from your hometown or anywhere you grew up. So it's just someone you've made acquaintance, acquaintance with before in a place that neither of you would have ever imagined. Yeah, I'm trying to think where it was. It was somewhere really weird. Um, well, I can think of one that was, it wasn't really anybody we knew, but I was with my family and we were in Ireland and what my husband, my ex-husband and I and my two boys all went to Washington State University and it's a very big deal and we're coogs and stuff. And we were in Ireland and this little Irish kid was wearing a, a WSU Cougar shirt and he didn't he wanted his picture taken with my kids and all this stuff and he didn't even know what it really stood for but we were so excited um that's not that's not very intimate but Lavinia did you have one 
I did. I ran into somewhere, someone somewhere, and I still can't think of where it was. But I love small world stories, so I'll think of it as soon as we all hang up. Um, but it does, you know, there, it's such a small world that it, it that kind of thing does happen. Marcia, were you going to say something? Yeah, I had one. So I was on a magazine story in Rwanda, and I had met. Um, people uh, at an NGO outside of Kigali. And when I went back, there was a new director who not only was from my hometown, but was the grown daughter, this is how old I am, of a college classmate of mine. It was crazy. And not only that, but there was someone there doing a film who turned out to be also from our hometown, which is Winchester, Massachusetts. And anyway, the hometown newspaper ended up doing the story about it because we're all like, wait, you're, what? You're, anyway, it's really funny. It was really strange. Yeah. I think Colette, did Colette, were you kind of raising your hand? Yeah. I just have a, I just have a quick one. I was in Venice, missed a train. So I was upset, went down a small alley trying to kill some time before the next train and ran into one of my childhood best friends, yeah. Pat. Wow. Yeah, and so then we spent the that time having a lunch and got a bottle of wine, and then I got on the next train. <laughs> but this was, I mean, this was like 20 years ago. Yeah. So I'm getting some questions about process um, and just the art of travel writing. So when you're in a space, obviously it's not a place that you're from. How do you go about deciding when, you, when you've understood the place enough to write about it, but you're still coming from that outside perspective. You're still putting yourself in that place as a traveler, but still, you know, breaking past that barrier, you know, starting to really understand the rhythms, um, understanding the surroundings. I mean, Erin, I know for you specifically, you spend a lot of time in Paris. so you've been traveling here more and more often. Um, and I'm sure that comes with some familiarity, but yeah, how do you balance familiarity with this unique traveler's perspective? Well, I mean, I think you, you started out by referencing the questions and not understanding. And so I always try to go straight for the thing I don't understand. And then, for me, when I start doing research, it's kind of this dance between the things that touched me about the place. And then I start doing research and it it's like a dance to me. It's like when you start doing research, it's almost like you unleash magic in your story because these connections start happening that are sort of like outside of you and you would never envision and they just, they just happen. I don't know. Anybody else want to kind of weigh in on that? I mean, I think that's, I, I, I was going to say that I always advise people to do a lot of research before they go on a trip. Um, not necessarily research about the topic they, they want to cover, but just find out about history and about the people and about the language because it can only inform the story that you write. But also when I'm traveling, I often don't understand, especially in personal essay, um, which is really what this book, for example, includes. But I often don't understand the story until much later, until I've had some perspective. Um, like I, uh, I have, published stories that happened 10 years ago because I finally understand what I want to write about that. And so that's probably the reason why I think it is so important to keep a journal when you're a writer, um, even if you end up burning them, you know, 20 years later or whatever, but Christina they, Christina. like Christina <laughs> has recently done um, to all of our respect and shock, um, but, but I think that just the writing down of something um, helps to helps us to understand it. And then if we write down what what we felt and what we and all those senses that that you can't look up later, then it really helps us when we do finally 
have that perspective and understand what we, what we want to write in about to go back and fill in the in the blanks. I'm not sure if that if if I have veered if I have, have gotten lost <laughs> as I want to do in the question, but that's kind no, of. I think that definitely makes sense. Coming back full circle when something hap when there's a current event that sparks something about you know something you took with you, which kind of leads me to my next question. All of you have mentioned keeping journals. Are there, is, do you take anything else with you? Are any of you photographers? Um, is there something you like to collect from each place or is it really just the memories that you carry? Well, I would wonder if Colette would, would maybe speak for a minute about um, sketching when you're traveling and, you know, creating some art when you're there. Yeah, so I mean, when I travel, and I always have it with me, it's just like my pencils and then some small paints. Um, and I, for when I do, because I'm always collecting stories, even though I don't write as much as I would like to, but I like doing audio recordings that I can go back to and then you just hear all the sounds. Or now I just do some like videos, which brings you right back. But for, yeah, for making art, I always just have a backpack that's a little too heavy, <laughs> but, um, and just ready to sit down and, and do a sketch. Cause it's always so much better when you get back into the studio, if you have a sketch and you have like the color samples, either like with my phone or just like, I'll just do some samples real quick. And then the scale of it, because your camera never I mean, I just, over and over again, I keep telling myself the camera is not gonna get the, the right shot. It's not gonna make it look like how it feels. So either do quick sketches or I'll sit down and actually just treat myself to like a good few hours, like a meal of sketching. <laughs> Thank you I for mean, saying it's all, that. It's all, about, it's all about like opening your senses, right? Yeah. But I'm always amazed when I travel with like Anna or Colette or, or Candace, either, either friend who's an artist, because they, they do that. They, you know, it's, it's, it's your way of taking notes in some, in some mm -hmm. cases, but it's really. I collect maps, cards. I'm writing a story about the Big Bend of Texas. I have notebooks, um, guidebooks, uh, little napkins, just all these things that kind of, I have just a big pile of things that sort of add to the, add to the texture. And I just basically travel with a fanny pack, the notebook, a camera. I make audio recordings too a lot if I'm driving <laughs> and I can't take notes. Yeah. Because when we're away from the place and we're writing about it, we have to recreate it. We have to recreate those moments. So, you know, we play music. We, I, I, I was writing about wine once and I, you know, like you got to drink the wine then if you're writing about it, right? You have your notes, but you also, you know, if you're writing about a baguette or you need to be eating it and it's all very sensory, I think. I think that's a great way to end our event. Taste the baguette, <laughs> take things with you. Um, I just wanna thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, this was my first panel and I, I can't, I couldn't be more grateful for the group it was with. You all are so warm. Um, and like I said, it, I had to come out of the trance that you put me in with your readings, with your stories. Um, so we really appreciated having you here tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Um, and so a few more closing words about our library. Uh, for those of you who are just discovering us, uh, the American Library in Paris is the largest English lending library in, on, the European, on, ugh, on the European continent. Um, and we hope you will join us for more programs in the future. Um, it was so lovely to see your engagement. I'm looking in the chat right now. So many lovely messages for our panelists tonight. So definitely join us in the future. I also wanted to remind everyone that the American Library in Paris is a nonprofit organization. So we are not supported by the French or American government, but rather we rely on the support and love from our patrons and donors. So thank you to supporters in the audience here tonight. Um, and if you would like to donate after tonight's event, 
you can revisit the link I sent with the Zoom link and go ahead and donate there. So thank you for in advance for your support. Um, and thank you also to our sponsor tonight, Grow at Annenberg. I'm gonna go ahead and leave you all with a video about our library and Grow. Um, if you wanna stick around to watch it, it's just about our history um, and Grow support. So thank you all again. Um, have a wonderful night. And until next time.